Perfect. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Andrew Petrosoniak. Um, here's a little bit of uh, background about him. So um, following an unsuccessful career as an amateur pickup basketball player, Dr. Petrosoniak now works as a TTL and an emergency physician at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. He is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and an associate scientist at Lika Shing Research Institute. Uh, and this allows him to figure out new ways to use simulation uh, to improve patient safety and infrastructure design. Uh, he's also interested in how clinicians can uh, be best taught technical skills that they'll only perform a few times in their careers. Uh, when he's not working, he spends his time with his family, trying to, vince it, trying to convince his daughters to wear their Raptors jerseys. Uh, I hope they got some good wear out of those this uh, nail biter of a, of a playoff season. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to him. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everybody for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Um, it's always a little bit different, I guess, you know, when we're giving these now at a, at a distance. Um, I think the best thing is I'll probably just go to the screen share and then you guys let me know. Um, just give me one second as we do that. Do I have a, a capabilities to do that? Yeah, it should. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Um, I, I guess I was hoping to be there in person, but obviously not possible. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Petrosoniak, uh, and I'm a, a eMERGE doc and, and trauma doc at St. Mike's. Um, I also am the lead for translational simulation at our institution, and that's um, part of why I think uh, Julie has asked me to uh, speak today. And uh, we'll be talking about using simulation to support institutional change. Um, and I think that that is something that is now, um, you know, certainly with COVID, uh, has highlighted for many institutions opportunities uh, different from what we traditionally use simulation for. Uh, so um, I do have I, my disclosure, I guess it, I do, uh, I've co-founded a company and not that we'll be talking about any of the work that we do, but but some of this, um, I do the, the same work uh, for, um, outside of uh, St. Mike's. I'll be presenting only St. Mike's stuff today, uh, but we, we work with architects uh, to inform the design of new uh, clinical spaces. Um, so the objectives um, of today, I want to talk about how we use simulation for quality improvement, uh, how we can link simulation to improving uh, patient outcomes, and, and then what does that mean for the institution? So I wanna start with, uh, I guess, my story or how I kind of got involved in simulation and what, how that's changed my view of how we can use simulation. And by all means, uh, one of the nice things, uh, I won't be monitoring for questions on, on Zoom, but if people have them, by all means, post them on the chat. And then Julie, do you wanna maybe collate them, I guess, or we can ask them after I just don't have the, um, with the screen share, I, don't, I can't see them in real time, but if people have questions, um, I'm happy to uh, to stop, yeah, and and feel free to just stop me, um, kind of periodically throughout the talk. I, I hope it, it should take probably I think we'll probably speak for about uh, 40 45 minutes and then open it up for for questions. So I uh, about five years ago we ran a study called the Trust Study and it and sort of then the subsequent data analysis and it's just being published um, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, but what we looked at, I, I was interested in how we train better. How do we use simulation to get better at our jobs? And I also became interested in insight use simulation for those that are unfamiliar with that. That's simulation within the workspace. So you can see here, this is screenshots of us running trauma simulations in our, uh, in our old trauma bay. And when we started this, the point was to see how we could train our teams better, but it quickly be, uh, became apparent that actually using insight use simulation was a great way of identifying challenges and issues within our workspace. And so what we did was we ran monthly insight use simulations, what we called risk informed simulations, simulations that were, the cases were built off of uh, issues that we had had, adverse events, unexpected deaths, uh, new protocols, anything like that. Um, and we, we built these cases and uh, ran these scenarios 
we would activate the trauma team. Uh, they would come down. They didn't know that it was happening. I mean, they knew that they, this would potentially happen over the course of a year, but they didn't know exactly when. So it was pretty unannounced. And they then ran through these scenarios. And when we brought in human factors experts to actually do a lot of the observations and the subsequent data analysis. And what we were able to uh, identify were, you know, a lot of challenges within our workspace that, that otherwise weren't maybe readily apparent or uh, that everybody knew they were there, but they hadn't been uh, objectively and systematically categorized. And so I'm going to show you one of the things that we identified uh, in this space. And this is a, a tracing tool that we developed and we published on this um, a few years ago. And so these are uh, a time lapse of three nurses moving with, during a simulation uh, for that uh, this simulation was a, a massive transfusion protocol sim. And you can see the amount of movement that they had, uh, particularly if, if anybody was serious about design, this would be the exact opposite of how you might design a space. Uh, the amount of uh, motion that these nurses uh, were required to undertake simply to do their jobs is, is just um, mind boggling. Yet, uh, if we, when we asked them if they felt like they were moving a lot, they, they, did, they really didn't. Um, they, I think that this is a common thing in healthcare, it's this learned helplessness that we all just get used to having to run everywhere and not having anything readily accessible. But what this did was this, offered, this allowed us an opportunity to highlight uh, some of the issues within the design of the space. And from this, we, we conducted an analysis and there were several other you know, high, uh, high level findings that we were able to identify. So obviously we found that there were inefficiencies in, in the use of our space. Vital sign monitors, I don't know about you guys in London, but uh, certainly it seems ubiquitous around the world that every vital sign monitor must be behind the airway person, uh, which is great if you're at the foot of the bed, but why we make, uh, you know, why, why we artificially uh, create a blind spot for our airway team uh, is, I don't, I don't have a good explanation for. Uh, so the vital sign monitors were, were out of the line of sight and what we were recognizing were, Yes, the airway team would recognize that there was desaturations. Sometimes the TTL or other members of the team were task focused on other things, but there were substantial delays in the recognition of hypoxia during trauma resuscitations. There was a lack of bundled equipment. So you could see from the, the tracing tool that we had, and we, we did other ones where we looked, uh, we ran um, simulations where crikes were needed to be performed and the crike equipment was not bundled. It was scattered around the room. Uh, in different places. And it was quite apparent that there was an issue there. And then there's a lack of uh, uh, workspace. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I can't see everybody just because of the way the screen share, but uh, you know, the um, proverbial hands up if you've ever put equipment uh, on a patient's chest, right? I, I'm pretty sure we all have. Um, and, and it drives me crazy that that happens yet. I, and I've done it and I continue to do it, or at least I did until we redesigned the space, but the patient should never be their own table for their own procedure. It's just not something that should happen. And, and you know, this creates sharps risks and all that kind of stuff. And these are the types of things that we were able to identify. Uh, and this is a picture of our old trauma bay. And uh, it's no longer the, um, it's now been demolished, but uh, this is about as clean as it ever was, and this was shortly before it was um, taken down. But what we were, you know, it, it clearly needed some revamping. And so as we were learning this stuff, running these simulations, we then came across, uh, you know, the institution decided that, we, that they were going to be building a new trauma bay for us. And we thought, well, suddenly we suddenly have all of this uh, data that would help inform the design of a new space. We thought this is wonderful. We, we thought we were just here to try and identify and fix the existing space, but maybe we could be proactive about this. And so we actually partnered with our architects that were, um, that were involved in the design of the space. And this is an example of, this is, you know, imagine this is the, the room, the trauma bay, and there's two beds and sort of a circumference of care around each bed. What we identified with the tracing tool was that roughly you need about six to seven feet on average to take care of a patient uh, from the kind of the center of the chest, so the radius um, around, around the patient bed. Uh, and 
that's fine. Um, it worked okay. Our old bed, our old trauma bay was two beds. Uh, and then the new trauma bay was not going to be much bigger in terms of a footprint, but they wanted to make it three beds. And this comes from, and I don't know if this happens to you guys, but, but what happens is the ministry comes in, they do, they run analyses and projections on what you're, uh, what you're going to be, you know, what the ED and the trauma bay will look like in 10 years. And they said, you know, we expect that you're going to have a 50% increase in your trauma volumes over the next 10 years. Great. So that means that if you have two beds now, you need three beds in the future. Okay. But what they fail to realize is that it's not that, you know, we might have a 50% increase per 24 hours, but it's not that we have 50% all the time. So we don't have three people all the time instead of two. Uh, yet they wanted to put three beds in. And, and I would love to have a three bed trauma bay rather than two. The problem is, is that they didn't give us enough space. And so what was going to happen was going to be the biggest design flaw of the new trauma bay was they were going to drop three beds into this space simply because some people that crunched some numbers said, hey, you need three instead of two. We actually pushed back on this. We worked with the architects. We designed a new trauma bay that has two. This is based on simulation-based data that informed this decision. We made a better decision. And you can imagine how frustrating it is to work in a clinical environment where if you were bumping into the bed adjacent to you, it, it would just be such a, it, it's, it's just the worst to go to work and the space not function the way it's intended. And yet we are always uh, experiencing this in healthcare. And so finally we were able to be proactive about this. This is a picture of our new trauma bay. And I'll just walk you through a couple of the highlights so I mentioned to you that uh, we have, um, can you guys see the, uh, the cursor moving around? Yeah, great. Um, so we have the, 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 um, the standard monitor at the head of the bed, which anesthesia or, or the airway team cannot see. But what we've done is we've added at the foot of the bed, uh, out of the way, uh, a great view uh, to see the vital sign monitors. So we've enhanced that. We've also put vital sign monitors on the sides. So there, and there's another one on this side. Uh, so there's 270 degrees of, of monitor. And, and to imagine that the most important data in the, the space is only shown on one monitor, um, it, it defies logic. We've also uh, created um, markings on the ground that allow us to uh, support nurses, TTLs, to nudge people into where they should be standing. It doesn't mean you can't stand there. You're not gonna get an electric shock if you stand in the white circle and you shouldn't be there. Uh, as much as I'd like to do that to sometimes to our colleagues, but um, that that uh, it allows us to sort of identify and say, okay, you know what, we're, we're, it's a bit too crowded in around the patient. Everybody that's not um, taking care, please just step outside of the um, the circle. We've also um, created hands. Up if can you see where the chest tubes are kept? Okay, there is nothing subtle about the design of this space. In the past we would have residents come in and say, oh, you know, I, oh, where are the chest tubes? And they'd be running around frantically. And our nurses, when we run these simulations, they were like, the, why doesn't anybody know where anything is? And, and so, yes, you can educate people, but you can also just make it so blatantly obvious that it's literally hitting them in the face. So you can see there's nothing subtle about our signage. Uh, it's easily accessible. We built these carts. Uh, these were the work primarily of Chris Hicks, my colleague, uh, who designed these. And so they now move to the bedside and then get pushed away when we don't need them. The other thing you'll notice is this is the high frequency cabinet. Uh, so this has all high frequency supply cabinet. It has all of the high frequency supplies that we use. So we stock into that. No longer, if, if, if we haven't redone our tracing tool yet, uh, but if we did a tracing, uh, we would see a vastly different amount of space uh, or distance traveled. And uh, it now works much better. We have stocking that exists in another area, and then it, and then the um, the supplies get replenished here. So this is what we immediately need for most traumas, and, it, and we're just a short distance away from the end of the bed. And so this now suddenly works, and it really is amazing to go to work in a place where you don't have to think about how you can do your job; you can just focus on the. Patient. And so what this allowed me to do is understand how simulation can do different things than what we're traditionally using it for. And from there uh, has developed uh, you know, my area of work 
in using simulation outside of traditional medical education, which it certainly has its value. But I believe that there's a lot more that we can do with that. And so simulation, we should recognize, is not a uh, technology. It's not a mannequin. It's a technique. And it's designed to replace and amplify real experiences with guided experiences. That's a quote from David Gaba, who is one of the uh, real founders of simulation and anesthetists um, in the US. The importance of simulation comes from when we start to look at the complexity with which we work now in our healthcare system, with when we work in our emergency departments, the number of protocols, processes, and now we throw COVID into the mix and that complexity has even gotten that much, um, th that much greater. So imagine the person driving this train, if you were to uh, teach them how to drive it, they could, you know, at some point, they would be able to move that train on the tracks. But if you uh, separate them from all of the rest of the tracks that we're seeing, then, then really, um, you, can't, you can't ignore that, that there's a lot of other things that are going on. If they want to move the train the way that they, that they expect to, they have to be able to navigate all of this complexity. And the same is within healthcare. And so what we're seeing using simulation, we can start to recreate these events, these situations with that complexity. And that we can start to break down this wall that exists traditionally between education and simulation and, and patient care, and we can link simulation to patient outcomes. And what we call this, uh, or what it's starting to be called, is we call this translational simulation. And so some people kind of equate this to insight use simulation because insight use simulation is often not educationally focused. But translational simulation basically means uh, it speaks to what is the objective of the simulation. The objective is to uh, identify and improve health service priorities and improve patient outcomes. And so that's the crux of the work that we're starting to do. And that's where there's certainly so much opportunity in healthcare uh, to, to build a, a, a robust simulation program. So no longer is simulation exclusive to those medical educators, but it's actually got a whole world uh, that, that that we can um, that, that we can access. Hands up if anybody. So there's this pandemic happening. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. COVID. Anybody familiar with that? Um, it's weird. I, I my kids are back at school, and it, I mean it's just such a uh, a wild time that we are in. Like my daughter was telling me yesterday. She's four. No, she's three. Three and a half. She just started JK. And she was telling me that she doesn't need to wear her mask outside because COVID doesn't, uh, COVID doesn't live outside really like it does in sun. Like this is, I just, I don't know. It's just such a, a, a wild time. I didn't expect that I'd be having uh, infectious disease conversations with my three and a half year old. So um, COVID has really opened the door, I think, to using simulation outside of the traditional space outside of the traditional medical education stuff. Uh, I would imagine, at least at our institution and many institutions I'm familiar with, and I'm not sure about London, but I think you guys probably also were running simulations to sort of update your protocols for uh, protected intubations, protected cardiac arrest. Certainly it was a common thing that was being done back in March, April, um, you know, around most of, uh, at least around North America and probably around the world. What it did was, we, we suddenly had this need to run, uh, to, under, to update and change our current practices. And I'll be honest, we have a lot of people in our ED group who are not really that interested in simulation. They have, you know, in fact, zero interest. Uh, but suddenly it's amazing what happens when your own health is directly linked or impacted by the protocol and how well you know it. And so, and, and suddenly they wanted to be a part of designing it. And it's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, the success that pilots have seen in terms of uptake with simulation for training and designing protocols, systems, designing their, their, their work environment. You know, we, can, we are suddenly potentially able to go down with the plane. 
uh, or at risk of going down with the plane. You know, if the protected intubation doesn't go well, I myself might get harmed. That's just not something that we as healthcare providers have ever really been, um, you know, uh, fortunately have never really had to experience or think of it. But it is a powerful driver for engagement. And it's something that certainly drove engagement and simulation at our institution, not only for education purposes, but actually having people participate in simulations to help uh, iterate uh, new, pro new, new processes, uh, designing uh, new carts, you know, how do we don and doff, all of those types of things. And so what we saw with simulation, this is something that we published uh, just a few months ago uh, from our experience at, uh, at, at St. Mike's. You can see in the red, most education, uh, most simulation was educationally focused prior to COVID. And then we saw really ramping up of simulation for protocol, usability, microsystem testing. And then as we solidified those protocols, uh, then we ramped up our education again, meaning we used, we designed the protocols, we made them better, and then we educated people with them. And, and so I think what this highlights is really the opportunities that, that we can start using simulation uh, in terms of a multi-purpose strategy here. So I want to focus on three things. I'm, I'm kind of giving you, you know, a bit of my experience and I'm going to layer that in over the next uh, 20 minutes or so a, a little bit more, but I want to focus on three elements of simulation uh, beyond education that they can focus on quality improvement, the focus for design, which I've already alluded to, and how we can use simulation to promote and enhance our organizational culture. Many of you, well, most of you probably drove, didn't drive anywhere today, but let's imagine that we were all in the auditorium together. You all would have driven to, and I would have driven uh, to, to, to work. And the car you would have driven, uh, no doubt a model of it has been crash tested. You, it would be unconscious, uh, unconscionable to, to imagine that you get into a car that hadn't gone through rigorous crash testing. It's not even allowed. The, uh, the, the, the manufacturers crash test the car. They find where the, the uh, blind spots are. They find where the weaknesses are. The engineers then revise it and it goes back. This is essentially just simulation of a uh, collision. Well, we can start to, we, we think of simulation in the same way in healthcare. It's a wonderful opportunity to crash test the system so that without ever harming a patient, so that the first time that a patient experiences a new protocol or a modification of a protocol, we are that much more certain that it can be uh, provided safely. And so for those that are QI folks, when we start to use simulation and layer it into quality improvement, we can think of running PDSA cycles first with simulation. How many times have you all experienced uh, you know, a new protocol that gets dropped in on you and you think, who designed this? And you know that it was just designed around a boardroom when a, you know, a bunch of administrators at 2 p.m. Uh, thought that it was a wonderful idea and then here you are on an overnight being like, this is awful. This is the worst idea ever. No one consulted me. No one asked me how this was going to work. And it just creates anger. And that's certainly happened to me. And yet why we allow this and we have a, you know, perfectly good strategies to mitigate this. And so we start to advocate now that you can use PDSA cycles first, simulate them, you know, put a mannequin in place. Or if you're designing a new way to get people through your RAS zone or rapid assessment zone or um, you know, how you reorganize your triage space, whatever it might be, that can all be tested prior to and iterated. And then by the time it gets to patients, well, you have a pretty good sense of where, where the, um, the, the, the breakpoints are. So we did this. Unfortunately, we, we had several code oranges in Toronto uh, over the last two years. We had the Raptors parade uh, last year where uh, there was several people shot uh, we had the devastating Danforth shooting, uh, which was uh, now, I believe, two or three years ago, where we had uh, two people killed and, and, and 13 people injured. 
and we had the uh, the North York van attack. And so we had it was kind of a real string of, you know, just awful um, events that impacted RED. And we had three code oranges within the span of about three years, legitimate code oranges. And it became very clear that there were some issues with our code orange. Um, and we needed to test them. So what did we do? We actually, last summer, we ran, uh, shortly after the uh, Raptors parade, we ran uh, a code orange. We uh, took over our emergency department, and this was a, a hospital-wide event. This was on uh, Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. So we had one live ED. There were real patients coming in simultaneously. We had five mannequins. We had 31 standardized patients. We, two of those patients, I think, needed massive transfusions, over 10 observers, and then we ran two debriefings. This was a massive undertaking. This was the uh, volunteers getting, um, getting uh, briefed uh, by our SIM team. And we were able to recreate, these are our residents, not looking, at, not abiding by their C-spine precautions, Um, and and in, we partnered with EMS and had them involved. And we triaged 36 patients in about 30 minutes. And we were able to stress our system. And really, we've never had a mass casualty of 36 people. But we were able to stress the system uh, and, and then really expose some of the challenges. And we had actually even put in some, um, some learnings that we had learned from the, the previous real code oranges. And then gradually people moved into, uh, into the, the clinical space where care was provided. And what we were able to do was we were able to uh, gather that information in the debriefings and observations and make changes so that the next time that this runs, which is inevitable, unfortunately, we're gonna be better prepared. And I really do believe that waiting otherwise can be very dangerous. And, it, and honestly, we can kind of eliminate rare events by just dialing up the intensity and frequency of our simulations. You could imagine that your ED could have a crike every week if you wanted using a simulation. Why do we wait? We know that the, actual, the next actual crike has a high chance of a complication that based on the literature. We know that. That's clear. It might go very well. But there is a good chance that the next time that you have an ED thoracotomy, a crike, a pericardiocentesis, a code orange, any of these rare events, uh, we ran a mass, uh, we, we ran an active shooter scenario um, uh, three years ago. All of these things are real, they're possible, uh, and they're likely in some way to happen. And yet we can eliminate them by running simulations and, and iterating, not just for the purpose of educating people, but actually we're removing all of the poor designs of those protocols, of those procedures. I'll give you an example. This is how we used quality improvement and simulation to improve our um, massive uh, hemorrhage protocol that we were, uh, we integrated this into the trust study. Uh, these, this, um, we were having, it was taking us about 11 and a half minutes to get blood to our bleeding trauma patients. Actually, like that, this is real time data. Uh, so we, we decided what simulation allowed us to do was to understand why these delays. And what we were noticing was that one of the, one of the things was you can't observe a process or a protocol very well in real time. But if you are, because how can you suddenly um, deploy a bunch of observers every time that there's going to be a massive hemorrhage protocol activated. It's just not feasible. And to be, you know, usually they're helping. I mean, we don't have extra clinical personnel kicking around just to watch this. But with simulation, you can schedule it, you can design it, and you can ensure that there's observers to watch these play out. And if you design the simulation properly, you can actually get people to behave in the way that they normally do in real life. And so what we saw when we ran these simulations, we saw that our porters, one of the challenges were, our porters were taking the patient care elevators with the little piece of paper to go to blood bank to get blood. We don't have a blood fridge in our trauma bay. And they were waiting in the patient care elevators that looked like Union Station on, you know, at 8 a.m. on a Monday. 
So they were like three rows deep, just waiting. And it was taking them like 10 minutes to get up and back. And, the, and uh, this was one floor that they needed to go. And there's a set of stairs right beside our trauma bay that would easily get them there in two minutes there and back. And so we identified this, we changed this, we made it a protocol that they have to take the stairs, that this is how they go, the standard route. And we made other changes along the way. We started to see a reduction in actual time to blood delivery for real trauma patients. This is what the most recent data that we've pulled, though, um, I think uh, actually right now we're running at around seven minutes to get blood for our patients from the time of uh, time uh, from activation to time to blood administration, which is pretty good, seven minutes. Uh, with our, we're to always targeting under, under 10. And so it's about a 21% reduction, at least from 11 and a half to nine minutes. And that might not seem like a lot, but, but there's data to suggest that for every minute delay in getting time to a bleed, uh, getting blood to a bleeding trauma patient, for every minute that you delay that, there's a 5% increase odds of death. So we're sort of working, you know, we're, we're, we're able to um, reduce that by about 12 and a half percent. And I think probably um, even better than that uh, if I were to pull the real data right now. And so what you're able to see is that we can use simulation to actually make improvements in the real time, uh, in the real clinical environment uh, and, and actually identify meaningful, um, meaningful changes that, that actually work. That we don't just uh, do things to just change something, but, but we can actually be targeted and focused and it's quite an efficient way. We can also use simulation for design. And, and if you have poor design, you may end up peeing on your colleague, right? So th this is, these are risks that exist. Um, but uh, more specifically, when we think about design, we, we, we actually, good design should be blind to us, meaning we should not notice it. Okay, I think, um, who has power seats in their car? I just got them not too long ago. So this was a kind of a new thing for me, but nobody needed to teach me how to use it, right? This is a wonderful uh, example of design here, right? Where your, your, the, um, the levers correspond to the position of the seats and you would toggle them uh, the way that you might expect you would want to move your seat, right? The horizontal one moves the seat forward and backwards and the, and the vertical one moves um, the, the backrest, uh, you know, uh, on an angle and tilts it. You don't need to teach anybody this. This is so intuitive. But anybody that has this in their car uh, never thinks, oh, this is a great design. It just works. And that's the way that design should be. But if, imagine we swap those levers around so that the one that faces, that is, that is vertically uh, positioned, moves the seat forward and backwards, and the one that's horizontal uh, moves the, the, tilts the seat rest back and forth, that would just be so counterintuitive, you'd be mad at it. And that's what happens in healthcare all the time, that our design of everything makes us so frustrated. We, in emergency medicine, what, what do we, we have everything working against us. We have undifferentiated patients. We have time pressures. They're not, you know, non-banking hours. We have limited resources sometimes. And, uh, and then you add that on to uh, a, a space that doesn't work properly. And it's just, it's not surprising that, that there are outcomes that we wish would be better. Now, the reason things go so well is often because we have resilient people. But wouldn't it be nicer to go to work and just have to deal with a challenging, you know, physiologically deranged patient than it would be to deal with a terribly arranged trauma bay? So we can use simulation, and I've already gotten at this, to better our designs. First, we can start to understand our clinical spaces. We can, want, we can use simulation to understand what we currently do, take the good things and use that to inform future design and get rid of the things that don't work. And so then we can scale up. And it's not just simulation with mannequins, but we run tabletop simulations. This is an example of our trauma bay in the early stages. And there was changes. This is not what it looks like currently, but um, we made changes with our architects along the way. And then we've built a mock-up of the space before, and before anything was ever done in real, in the actual environment. This is in an office um, within, within the hospital. They built us, they put in arms and everything. And we ran simulations there. We took that data back 
that we gathered, the feedback went back to the architects, and then we eventually started to redesign the space. And we also, this is our emergency department before it opened, in, in a separate part, in a separate part, we used simulation to do some final design uh, designs of the, the of the actual space. You can see there's post-its on the wall. Uh, this is where we were moving um, this this back um, uh, this headboard. Uh, things got moved around. This ends up getting moved over here. Anyway, so just some changes. Uh, or sorry, this was over here and now got moved over here because nurses fed back that they didn't want to be moving into a room with a sharp. They want to be moving out of the room. Anyway, subtle design changes that we were able to make using simulation and not having to wait for a real adverse event. And from that also emerges innovation. And this is an example of our resuscitation tower, our recess towers. So in our new ED, um, we've, the decision was made that we want to make sure that we can resuscitate a patient in any room as a principle. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, and, but how do we do that? Well, we have to bring the equipment to the bedside. Well, how do we do that in a quick and, and, and easy fashion? Well, Chris Hicks and I designed these resuscitation towers so that they can be easily brought to the bedside. It's, it's, it's so clear that you don't need teaching how to use it. As long as you can read a couple of letters and a number or two, you're in good shape. And so this emerged and, and from, from our findings, from getting feedback from clinicians in simulation, what do they need? What are the challenges that they face? And this actually is uh, the final product, but it didn't look like this initially. There were substantial changes that we used. We didn't just roll this out. Because why would you do that? Why would you drop something into a new ED that no one has had a chance to give feedback on? It's a terrible way of gaining trust among your clinicians. Yet every day this happens around the world. And so at risk, and this is, I would never recommend quoting yourself in your own talk, but I am going to. But a, a real patient should never be the first test case, uh, should never be the first case to test a new clinical space. I firmly believe this. And we at St. Mike's are now um, implementing this so that every new, to every time we, we have a new space that's being designed, we test it first. So I'm going to end with a talk on or uh, discussion about how we can use simulation for organizational culture and, and enhancing that. So I think this is, this is key. Never so key than now when we're in the throes of a pandemic where all of us are feeling burnt out, where it's challenging to go to work. We have to wear masks. It's harder to communicate. We have new protocols. We can't, we're, you know, we have to put on PPE every time we want to do something. We're still running risks of, you know, what if this patient has COVID? How does that impact me? Now I have to go home to my loved ones, my family, all of that. All of these things that we're navigating. We can't go to Raptors games anymore. Um, that's because they've lost. But, but also, you know, it would be lovely if I could have been at playoff games. But, you know, these are things that everything all adds up. And now we have a, a you know, then we have to go back to work where it is, it is, it's not an easy place to work sometimes. So how can we use simulation to help improve that? Well, in a, um, th there's a few examples and simulation regularly done within the clinical environment really has uh, opportunities uh, for an institution. So this is uh, a study that was done uh, two years ago um, and what they looked at was a, a healthcare network in the U.S. So they had, I can't remember exactly how many hospitals, but somewhere between 10 and 20 hospitals. And they decided that they were having some issues with their code blues. And so part of that strategy was to implement mock code blues, uh, both for teaching purposes, but for also improving uh, the protocols and examining the protocols. What, what the health network didn't tell each hospital was how often they needed to run them. They just said, you have to run some. Okay. So what these, um, what the, the authors did was they looked at the hospitals and they, and they categorized them into those that ran uh, in situ SIM code, code blues frequently and less frequently. So three, three um, in situ SIM code blues, per hundred beds per year. So what most of the, the hospitals in London, kind of four or 500 beds, 
that would equate to, you know, a low frequency, yeah, that would be sort of one a month. Okay, and high frequency, uh, you know, imagine that's around 80, 90 um, a year. So one every 10 days. And so they looked at this and they said, I wonder what the impact of that is on actual patient survival in, in, out of, in, in hospital cardiac arrest. So in hospitals that had low frequency mock codes, 31% survival, high frequency mock codes, 42% survival. Now, I get it, this is not a randomized trial. So it's hard to know exactly what the, uh, what, what the reasons for this are. But what it probably speaks to is that there are multiple things that happen when you start to engage your teams on a regular basis about improvement, in part using simulation. And what this translated to is for every uh, inside you sim mock code per 100 beds, there was one life saved. If that's not a reason enough to start to investigate this and to use this as a strategy, I don't know what is. You know, what might be happening is it might not be the sim itself. It might be the fact that you ran the simulation and then you have nurses, physicians, RTs on break talking about how they might be able to improve. They might be more likely to want to engage in an improvement strategy for a particular protocol. They might be more likely to go home and read. I don't, you know, all of these things, we don't exactly know what it is, but there's something that we see happen in institutions that frequently uh, engage their teams in simulation. And it's not just in mock codes, it's uh, in, uh, on, in cardiac arrest, it's in it's, uh, pediatric trauma sites. Those that run high volume simulation have lower mortality. Now, some might say, well, that's because uh, sites that have high volume simulation also have lots of resources and they're better at what they do. Okay, well, that's maybe true. But it's probably because they practice. We know that people that practice do better than those that don't. The rest of my work that I spend time doing is about practice, and that's, that's clear through any domain, that practice makes you better. And ultimately, this downloads onto patients having better outcomes. People then say, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing simulations as much because it's an extra strain on our clinicians. It's extra time. And I get that. And I think that that has to be carefully navigated. What we can't do is require more of our clinicians. We need to design a program so that it fits within their existing work time. We can't add more to people's work time unless they're willing. But what we do know is that there's a wonderful study out of France. They randomized their, uh, um, their nurses to uh, receiving just traditional education versus just a simulation and debriefing education package. And their outcome was job strain. And so what, it was a five day simulation uh, program uh, and it cost money. So it was an upfront investment, a couple thousand dollars per nurse. So it's not cheap, but the long-term benefits are substantial. We'll talk about that in a second. But what they noticed in the intervention group, those that received simulation on a, at a six month time point on a, on a job strain scale, which is regularly used and linked to job performance, 13% experienced job strain versus 67 in the control group. Secondary outcomes were also important. They had higher rates of absenteeism. They actually lost uh, a substantial number of nurses in the, uh, the, the, in, the, um, uh, in the control group and none in the intervention group. That actually cost money. And so they were ahead financially by actually, despite the fact that they had to backfill nurses so that they could uh, participate in these simulations, overall it translated to um, a better financial situation for the institution. So we're talking about money. We, should, we, should, we, we can't ignore that simulation can be expensive. When we start to look at this though, the numbers actually always tip in favor of simulation. So this is, a group that ran simulations, mock codes. Uh, they, they, it was a hundred thousand uh, dollar program. They, they dropped into their uh, into their uh, hospital, and this was for pediatric codes. 
and, and pediatric um, resuscitations that happened uh, on their floors. And what they found was by running these simulations, they found that patients were uh, being uh, moved into the ICU earlier. They weren't deteriorating as much. The ICU then was able to get ahead of the illness. They had shorter lengths of stays and it translated to basically freeing up one bed per day throughout the year, a savings of approximately $1.3 million. Same thing happened with procedural skills simulation. This institution put together a package for training and um, finessing their, um, their central line insertion in the ICU, in the clinical space. So they taught people, they, they, they changed their protocol, they made it better with clinician feedback through simulation. It cost them $112,000. What they were able to do was to save uh, substantially through reductions in catheter associated bloodstream infections because each one of those, when, every time that event occurs, it's a roughly one to two week uh, extended length of stay in the ICU. So a seven to one return on investment here. Okay, so I wanna finish with I guess a thought experiment, a, a, an idea that, you know, we're all gonna, we've all drank the simulation Kool-Aid. I have been able to say, let's imagine that I've successfully convinced you that simulation is not just for education, but it's for uh, multiple areas within our space. And we're all hospital CEOs and we're building a new emergency department. And so we start with, we decide we're gonna engage in simulation in multiple avenues. And we start by looking at how our, clinicians are currently working and we run simulations to better understand that to inform the design. And then we work with architects, architects come in and watch those so that they can provide better design uh, suggestions, that the plans are better. And then before uh, even, even uh, shovels hit the ground, we've built mock-ups of the spaces so that we can then run simulations we, of the new spaces, the proposed spaces, we make changes so that by the time the space is built, it's been tested and it's been refined and the clinicians are as satisfied as possible. No doubt we'll be bringing over processes from our old ED and some we're gonna keep and some we're gonna get rid of, but we're gonna be able to test these. We're gonna be able to diagnose the challenges with them and we're gonna make, be able to simulate interventions and adjustments and modifications. And so that when we bring in these new processes, when we bring in existing processes, we know that they work. And we reduce that frustration that we all feel when something is dropped in on us without being tested and without getting our feedback. And then we continue on as our ED is now up and running, we run regular simulations, both for education and for quality improvement. And we result, we have better patient outcomes. And along the way, we're collecting data and we're like, wow, we have all of this extra money because we've developed, we've been able to save money, not having to retrofit everything that we are so accustomed to doing. And throughout this, because we listen, we listen to our clinicians and we actually show them, hey, you know what? That simulation last week resulted in a change in this protocol. We're starting to build a positive culture. And we demonstrate to uh, internally and externally that we're actually a learning organization. So in summary, simulation is definitely more than education. I believe translations, translational simulation is going to be part of our future, if not our current reality. And simulation can help inform quality improvement, design, and then our culture. And it's undoubtedly something that is key for any learning organization. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you so much for uh, your talk, Andrew. I know uh, Sean Kane had messaged me with uh, a question. Sean, do you do you want to start? Uh, sure, uh, Andrew. Thanks again for uh, the great presentation, and uh, thanks for joining us uh, for rounds. It was uh, nice to see you again. Hi, Sean. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, how much or how do you decide how to accommodate? Uh, heterogeneity and, and individual physician practices in the design uh, how much of that versatility can be built into the design and I guess 
at what point do you just also have to ask the physicians to collapse into a single uh, type of practice uh, for the space and for efficiency? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you can, um, we would run, uh, during the simulations, we actually might provide different options, right? And, and so there's no better way to demonstrate what might be the preferred option by letting people experience that for themselves and make their own decision, right? If they can see that there's an issue with whatever way that they might do something. So for instance, um, when we were running simulations for our protected intubations, I mean, we were certainly advocating for people to be using video laryngoscopy. Uh, obviously, we didn't mandate that, but you know, coupled with fear and the right teaching, we were able to upskill a lot of and, and demonstrate to people that 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 they could actually, you know, that some of the 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 um, uh, some of our clinicians that weren't accustomed to using it, they would typically use DL. Uh, that, that, that this was actually manageable. So um, I don't think that you can, you, you know, only in the, the, the most rare circumstances. So we've man mandated, I guess, we've pretty much mandated through, through education uh, and, and protocol development that we all use a bougie crate when we run a crate. So, so and we make it that that is the easiest way to get it done. We teach people, we make the kit desirable to use, uh, and, and so that that is the, we nudge people in that direction. I'm a strong believer in uh, allowing people to uh, uh, still have their autonomy for their own decision. But if you design a space for what you think they should be doing that works best for them, then you can nudge people towards the direction that you want, yet still allow options. So in our trauma bay, it pains me, but we still have a Melker kit in our difficult airway cart. It never gets used. It's there for somebody's own, you know, well-being, I, I guess, not for the patient, that's for sure. But it is there. And in the event that, you know, an anesthetist who is most comfortable with that wants to use it, I wouldn't want that to impact a patient negatively. So you do, you can design the space so that it's there, yet still have, what's the thing that they actually see when they look for the bougie crate or for the crate kit? It's the bougie crate kit but you have to couple that with education. So, um, and if you, if you, you use, if you give people a why, meaning give them why it is that you think they should do this, then, then suddenly you can kind of move people in that direction that you want them to. If you can, you know, there's three ways to get people to change. You can make, uh, you can appeal to their emotional side, which is the easiest. You can appeal to their rational side, which is deadly difficult. Uh, because people are not rational most of the time, myself included. And you can make it easy for them to do what you want. And so what we do, we don't, we, uh, the rational person would say, well, based on the literature, bougie crike is probably the best. It seems that it bears out, you know, the fastest to kind of put in a crike. But the emotional side of, mm, I haven't really learned that. I'm going to use the Melker kit. Okay, that's fine. We'll allow that to happen but we're going to make it so easy for you to use the bougie crate because we're going to develop, deliver a simulation based education package and we're going to design the kit better than the milker. And so now you are more likely to use it. Hey, thanks Andrew. Um, I know our chair chief Christy had a question or a comment. Hi, great. Thanks, Andrew. I'm Christy. I'm the interim chair chief here in London. Thank you for coming and giving this excellent presentation today. I feel like I have to do a bit of mea culpa at the very beginning. Early on the pandemic, I sort of, uh, with the information available at the time, made the best decision and decided not to proceed with in situ simulation for a variety of reasons. And thankfully, Julie and Chantel uh, created an excellent virtual simulation. I'm not sure if you've spoken with them about that. In your presentation, certainly uh, moving forward as we move into our negative pressure rooms in our ED, um, I will be looking after your presentation about how do we do that for our staff and make it the most usable space and have been in contact with Julie and Chantel. So I appreciate the learnings from that and optimizing our space. I must say I'm a little bit envious of your very progressive approach in doing simulation and designing a new department. We won't have that luxury here, uh, but I do appreciate all the points and the time that you took today. Certainly lots of opportunity here in London. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I think 
you, you know, we, we did dial back on our in-situ sim. Like we were very focused on what we were using. I mean, we weren't running it regularly. We, we run quarterly in-situ sims for our staff in our EDs normally. Um, we, we stopped that during COVID. We're just starting up again. So I think, you know, you do have to be mindful of there are, you know, we were concerned that we were going to be using PPE during this time and how do we bring people together? And so I don't, I don't think that, you know, it, we were very focused on the types of simulation we were using. It was all primarily for airway, cardiac arrest with our new, you know, with all of the protected um, protocols that exist. We weren't looking at other other elements, so we were pretty deliberate. And I think you know you have you have to make the best decision that you you know, have at the information at the time. I don't know if it's regrettable to look back at that's the information you had, and that that made sense. So, but going forward, it's certainly um, you you it's not an all or none approach. You could probably drop in some stuff that might you know uh, enhance um, the the usability and workspace for your for your teams. All right, in the interest of time, I know it's 10 o'clock, maybe one last comment or question if there's one out there. All right, I'm not seeing it all. I'm not seeing anything. So again, thank you so much, um, Andrew, for taking the time to join us today. Um, I know we have a lot to think about after your presentations. Um, I know you're giving talks now to the residents, but how about we take uh, five minutes or so just to give everyone a chance to go to the bathroom, grab right. a beverage. Um, again, thanks very much. Lovely to see everyone this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay. Julie, do I stay on here? <laughs>